Okay, so we uh, there, there's no handout for the for the Kuzari today, because um, uh, we're just going to actually we're just we're going to finish a very very long paragraph. We're going to finish uh, paragraph three today in the Kuzari, and, and many of you know that you know have, you've been learning with us for quite some time that the uh, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi structured his Kuzari in five essays, and each essay is broken down by paragraph numbers, but the paragraph numbers sometimes can go on for pages and pages. And so in the Feldheim edition sort of breaks down those paragraphs artificially in you know, sub-paragraph numbers. Um, and that was just what we did in order to create some way of referencing where we're holding. So we are on page 417 uh, in, in the Kuzari. We're in the fourth Ma'amar, and we're finishing uh, um, uh, the third paragraph. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake. We're on page 419, excuse me, 419. Uh, and so we're finishing the third, par the third paragraph. We're on subparagraph 51 to show you how long this section has been. It's one of the longest paragraph sections in the whole in the whole safer. We were talking about last week, we were talking about what the term kavod Hashem or or kavod Elohim, the glory of God, what that means. And we had uh, as an adjunct to what Rabbi Huda Halevi was talking about, we brought in the Moren of Uchim from Maimonides Guide for the Perplexed, where the Rambam had given us uh, three different perspectives as to what uh, as to what kavod Hashem actually means, and uh, um, um, just to just to help you review, sometimes kavod Hashem could be actually a a physical creation that God brings into this world at a certain place and a time to show that the place and time that is being designated it is attached with divinity. So, so, so certainly, let's say, a cloud of glory that rests upon the Mishkan in the desert can be called Kavod Hashem, the glory of God. Um, the second um, explanation is where the Rambam and Rabbi Yehuda Halevi had disagreed with each other, which was what uh, when Moshe said, show me thy glory, Hareini na et kavodecha. Um, is that something which refers to the essence of God? Is that something that man can be shown? So for the Rambam, Moshe was denied that request because no human being can possibly see the glory or the essence of God. But for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, um, it was really asking God to show him some manifestation of God's essence in this world. Um, and, and um, so that was what we saw uh, in paragraph 49. Um, and then the third definition, which is where we're going to see that they agree again, is um, the third definition of the Rambam was sometimes the term glory denotes the glorification of the Lord by man or by any other being. In other words, it really refers to the kavod, the honor that God receives when, when people are capable of admiring the universe and the creation uh, and then attributing that beauty and that glory, that majesty back to God. So we call that admiration, we call that, or the source of that admiration, we call that kavod Hashem. So it's the, the natural universe, the, the, the creation itself can sometimes be the glory of God. Those were the three definitions that we saw in the Morin of Uchim, uh, um, section one, uh, chapter 64. So if we continue uh, in the Kuzari on page uh, 419, paragraph 51, he says, this then is the meaning of the terms glory of God, um, kingship or malchut Hashem, ushchinat Hashem, or in the divine presence of God, as they are commonly found in the Torah. But then he says that sometimes these terms are used to describe the laws of nature as, as melochal ha'aretz kivodo, the whole world is filled with God's kavod, is filled with God's glory. And umalchuto 
Bakol Mashala, that God's kingdom, really also again referring to the glory of Hashem, his majesty, rules over all. In reality, though, glory and kingship can be witnessed only by God's chosen elite and prophetic class who demonstrate through their prophecies to the heretics that God's rulership and kingdom are extant and that he is cognizant of the various components of, of his creation. So what Rabbi Huda Halevi seems to be saying is that when we use the term glory of God to reflect on all of creation, it's a borrowed term. Really, the only people who are capable of sort of demonstrating God's true glory are the prophets who actually have um, personal encounters with God. At such time when the whole world will be shown this glory, it shall genuinely be declared that God is king, the glory of God shall be revealed, God will rule forever, say to Zion, your king rules, and God's glory shines upon you. In other words, in a sense, really, mankind can only see a semblance of God's glory in this world, unless you're a prophet. If you're a prophet, you can actually recognize God's glory, even in a world which is somewhat opaque and is not completely reflective of that glory. So that's really the... That's really the point that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi wants to make is that there are two types of glory. There's the general glory that um, you can see that when you look out into the world and appreciate nature, you see one level of God's majesty and greatness, but the true glory of God will, is reserved for some time in the future. We had made mention before that the, the Talmud makes a point of saying that when a person recites the Shema, they should say the sentence, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed. You should say that in a whisper. You should say that quietly. And the question is why? Why is, that, why is it necessary to say that verse quietly? The, the Talmud gives a very cryptic answer. It says that, well, Moshe, when he gave the Jews the Torah, omitted that line. He just said, Shema Yisrael in, in the book of uh, Devarim. He said in Deuteronomy, he said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Ve'ahavta, Eit Hashem Elokecha. He completely omitted that line. But according to our oral tradition, when Jacob's sons were gathered around his deathbed, and he wasn't sure whether they were all faithful to God, they proclaimed in unison, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And at that point, Yaakov, Jacob said, Baruch Shem Kevod. Which is a response that a person gives to the term to the statement of Shema Yisrael. So the question, so the Talmud says, well, Moshe did not say it, Jacob did say it. So the compromise is, is that a person should say it in a state of silence. What does that even mean? And and what what is the deeper explanation of what the Talmud is saying? Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is giving us some level of explanation here. He's saying that there, is, there are two ways of understanding what God's glory is. There is God's generic glory that is manifest in all of nature. You just have to look out at creation. And as Maimonides had said, that, um, uh, that the, even the heavens, Hashemayim Mesaprim Kavod Kel, the heavens relate the glory of the Almighty. Um, and what that means is, is that you can look at n nature, you can look at the way that the, the heavens work, you can look at the, at the petal of a flower, and you can see such complexity and, and such um, uh, grandeur in every small, even the smallest or largest component of nature, so that you can see some, something about God, you can see some, that, that there's a, a scientific plan and a, and a beauty that exists throughout nature. And that's on the one hand called, called God's glory. But there's a different kind of glory that the prophets talk about. When they talk about God's glory and they talk about God's kingship only being manifest in the future world. They say, you know, Bayom Hahu, on that day, God's name will be one and he will be one and his glory will be manifest. So which one is it? Is his glory manifest right now when you look out at the world? Or is it something that we're waiting to become manifest in some time in the future? 
So Rabbi Yehuda Halevi uh, finesses this sort of, and he basically says, well, there's two levels. There's the generic glory, and then there's the absolute glory that can only be understood and witnessed either by a prophet today or by the whole world when the Messiah comes and everyone will reach that level of prophetic understanding of God because God's revelation will be more manifest in the world. So that, in a sense, is why we say the verse, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed, quietly, is because on the one hand, we're registering that there is some kind of kavod that is manifest in the world right now, but we realize that it's a subdued kavod. It's a completely pale kavod to the kavod that we're waiting to be able to witness in the future. So in order to sort of finesse that, there's like, there's two types of kavod. There's the real kavod, which we don't have any relationship with because we're not prophets. So we have to say it silently. And yet there's still this uh, generic kavod or sort of a pale type of kavod that it compels us to be able to make some statement right now, but we say it quietly. Go ahead, I'm open to questions, comments, anything. So talking about um, of Hashem, and, uh, wow, the, the miracle and the sign is so great. I was wondering, though, so what about the things in nature that are horrible, like the earthquake that caused 50,000 people? That's nature also. Yeah. It's a Correct. There are many things that are horrific in nature, uh, is Ms. what Mrs. Sachashevsky is asking, but I would have respond to that, that there are two ways of seeing God's glory. One is by seeing the beauty in it, and one is seeing the fierceness of it. You know, uh, uh, God is not to be trifled with. God is not to be, um, you know, you don't, you don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. Um, and you don't, uh, you don't mess around with God. Um, and, and, um, and, and that's the, that's the lesson of seeing the devastation of an earthquake is that you see that nature is both beautiful and, and, and terrifying at the same time. You look at a tornado and the devastation that it wreaks, but you can't help but being in awe of just the magnitude of what, right? Or, or a, a tidal wave, a tsunami, the same thing. You, but they're, they're, they're not contradictory. You can see the storm and you can see the calm after the storm. Um, you can see um, a, a torrential hurricane and you can also see this beautiful sunrise or sunset on the ocean. It's the same nature and, they're, and, and one is beautiful and one is awesome. And they're both the same. It's two sides of the same coin. Yeah, that's right. You don't, you've never been inspired by looking at the sunrise or the sunset. You've never looked at a, a bed of flowers and just, and, and see the bee at gathering the pollen and just marveling at just the miracles of nature. Okay, I'm and I'm asking you, I'm asking you, Rachel Sachachevsky, to ask yourself, why am I more affected and impacted by the devastation of a hurricane than I am by the beauty of a sunset? So it, it, we all care about people. And I think that's a very sensitive thing for you to say. And you're hundred percent right. The, the, the impact on human life is far greater, but um, human life is also an act of God, right? And every, we're, all, we're all connected. This is all part of a, a universe that is that is created by God's by God's work. Yeah, I think that, um, so we 
Like it has to be, creation has to be God created because if you look at the intricacies of let's say the eye or a cell and all the little details, I mean, it's just impossible that it, it's random, you know, like, oh, so, so then my son says, well, you're looking at all that, but what about all the things that are not so great, like these horrible genetic diseases and just anomalies, you know, like the question is more like why, right? If you're gonna look at the, we all yeah. interpret the glory yeah. of God as a positive thing, but like why, right? Why? Okay, I, I guess, I, I guess, I guess you could rephrase it the way Linda is, is saying it is, you could look at the miracle of life, and you could also look at the horrific tragedy of when mutation occurs and deformities exist. So you could see one child being born with, with completely normal limbs and say that's a miracle and you could look at a child god forbid born with deformities sometimes horrible deformities and say why right and and so the um i think linda you're making an excellent point the the question of why why would god not allow the miracle to occur uh, with, for a certain percentage of people why does God allow the rules of gravity and, and, and weather to govern lives, the lives of societies? And then with, under a few exceptional situations, God allows chaos to ensue and allows death and suffering and deformities and things like that to, to occur. And uh, uh, I, I think that one is, should not be more awe-inspiring than the other. It's just awe-inspiring in two different ways. When you consider all the things that could potentially go wrong um, when a child is born, um, you, you can appreciate the miracle of, an, of a child who is completely healthy at birth. Um, and, and I think the same thing is true with, um, with just nature in general. Um, the, the, I don't think that the theodicy question of why um, should interfere with man's ability to appreciate the beauty and the majesty of the world. Yes, it's a question, and we have to be able to contain in our minds those questions of why. But at the same time, we're still able to, while, we're, while we are containing that question, we're still able to enjoy this moment. It's like, you know, the Gemara, I've, I've quoted this Gemara before, where um, um, the Gemara says, Bishas Chedva, Chadi, uh, I forget the exact language, but at the time of mourning, you mourn. At the time of joy, rejoicing, you rejoice. Is it, it, they're not contradictions. We all know that when a baby is born, uh, it's going to live out its life and it's going to die. So why not sit Shiva when the baby's born, if you know it's going to die? Because everyone dies. And the answer is, is that you rejoice at a time of birth and you mourn at a time of death. Just because we know that horrible things also take place in the world that should not preclude us from being able to admire the beauty when beauty is in front of us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else? This is a very, very good discussion. I want to, and I thank you for raising the issue. Anything else? Let me see. I see some comments on the screen. Uh, Hashem Echad, he is the master of both the good and what we consider bad, and we attest to that in the Shema. Um, uh, okay, so yes, and that's really Kavod Hashem comes after the word Shema, which is God is the great unity. Very good point, Karen. Responsible for both the bad and the good, and that's also part of Kavod Hashem. Roy asks, why do we say Baruch Shem Kavod aloud on Yom Kippur? Excellent question. And the answer is that even though Rabbi Yehuda Alevi had said that the true kavod of Hashem is reserved for the future world and for prophets, the assumption is, or like the affirmation that we make on Yom Kippur is that we are, 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 are striving to reach the level of the angelic on Yom Kippur, to be able to transcend normal human 
understanding on Yom Kippur, to go to a different zone, a different dimension of consciousness on Yom Kippur, to the point where we can actually affirm that the glory of Hashem is actually right in front of us right now. Even though normally it's not visible the rest of the year, on Yom Kippur it is visible to us. And that's really what we, what we are hoping to achieve on Yom Kippur. It's not a guaranteed achievement, but that's the reason for saying it out loud on Yom Kippur. So let's just finish on page 420. We'll finish this up. And he says, there is therefore no need to distance ourselves from such statements as he gazes at the picture of God. Now, I just want to remind you, because we're getting at the very end of this paragraph. How did we start this paragraph? It's so, it was such a long time ago. It was all the way back on page 392, almost 30 pages ago, where the Kuzari had asked a very simple question. How can I know the name of an entity which cannot be comprehended and is known only by his deeds? There's no way to truly understand God. And we had, we had seen the Rambam make that affirmation uh, in, in our studies last week as well in the Mora Nebuchim, that uh, you'll only be able to see, um, you won't be able to see my essence but you'll only be able to know me by my traits. And that's the source of the 13 attributes of God's mercy. So um, Rabbi Huda Halevi acknowledges that, but then says that there are glimpses of God in this world that God can manifest. And so therefore, even though we cannot uh, apprehend God's essence in our mortal forms, but there is therefore no need to distance ourselves from such statements as he gazes at the picture of God, they saw the God of Israel or from the vision of God's chariot or from the mystical account of God's height. This is a, uh, there is a, um, a, uh, a Midrashic text called Pirkei Hechalot. And there's also something known as Shi'ur, Midrash Shi'ur Koma. Um, and all of these relig, and it describes God's bodily measurements, if something can be said about that. Um, Maimonides was very disturbed by this Midrash and he therefore said that it's, it's not an authentic Jewish midrash, it's a forgery, it's of Byzantine origin, but all of the other commentaries, including Reb Yehuda Halevi, understand that it is an authentic midrash, but it describes God in anthropomorphic terms. All these relate to the images that are given to the prophets. God allows these to be seen because they help to instill his awe within one's soul, as it says, and in order that his awe should be upon your faces, and so forth. So. The way he concludes this uh, very long uh, section is to basically point out that it's true. I concur that no one can understand and really un know God's essence. God, however, shows glimpses of himself in anthropomorphic form in prophetic visions. And that's what many of these passages mean in scripture when they say, that he saw God or he saw God doing something and so forth. No one should mistake that to mean that God is visible to anybody, not even to a prophet, but God provides these glimpses of himself in a metaphoric way because they help to instill his, one, um, his awe within one's soul. Uh, and that's the way God works, is that he allows man to see some representation of him either in this world or in a prophetic vision, so that man can feel that some sense of kinship and connection to Hashem and feel some sense of awe. And with that, we finish this section, paragraph three, and we'll continue Bezrat Hashem after Pesach when we continue the Kuzari. So with that, I'd like to suggest that we go on to, the, to our Parsha for today. And I have a very interesting piece that I wanted to share with you, um, and I'll share my screen now. Let's see here, share my screen. Uh, okay. We, we begin the book of Vayikra this week, and the book of Vayikra is all about Korbanot, and I thought that it's worthwhile for us to talk about Korbanot for just a short period of time, even though this is not something that has tremendous appeal to you and me, as far as, you know, whether it's animal sacrifice or flower sacrifice. Um, in just a couple of weeks, we will be coming out with our, our um, 
semi-annual journal called Chachme Lev. The Chachme Lev journal is, um, it's, we're now up to uh, issue number four, and it's really uh, turned out to be a really quality journal of essays from members of the Bayit and members of the larger Jewish community, very, very thoughtful ideas that are being presented of all different kinds of topics in Judaism. And my, uh, my essay for um, this issue of Chachmei Leib is all about what service in the temple will look like when we build the third temple, especially in light of the fact that human beings have developed a certain compassion to animals to the point where so many people are vegan today. What does that mean as far as animal sacrifices are concerned? Rav Cook took a position that uh, in the third temple, there will be no animal sacrifices, or at least at one stage of the third temple, there will only be um, vegetable sacrifices and no more animal sacrifices. Even though our liturgy does not seem to reflect that, but that was nonetheless the position that he took. And so I discussed that in this essay. The question though is, what are we supposed to derive from a discussion and a reading of animal sacrifice, because it does form such a central uh, theme throughout the Torah, especially in the book of Vayikra, which we're beginning this week. So in order to sort of frame this idea, um, I wanted to share with you a piece from the Midrash and Rav Cook's uh, exposition on that Midrash. So here's the Midrash. It's from Vayikra Rabbah. And it basically states as follows. So I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, if you cannot see the screen, just give me a holler, okay? So the Midrash says as follows. Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana Rabbi Hanan Turavaihun B'Shem Rabbi Azariah Dikfar Chitaya. First, the Midrash tells us who said this, and it's basically being quoted in the name of a Rabbi Azaria from the village of Chataya. And he said, He says, a king had two chefs. It's not just enough for a king to have one chef. He's got to have two chefs. So the first chef made for him a meal. He ate it and he was very pleased. He gave him a thumbs up and he said, Chef Jacques. That was phenomenal. That food was great. Now, the Asa Hasheni Tavshil Vaachalo Vaarevlo. And then Chef Guido made another meal for him. And he said, Guido, thumbs up. That was excellent. The question is which chef is the better chef? The Einanu Yodim, Ezemehem Arevlo Yoter. It's not clear which chef he prefers. The only way to know is when the king puts in his request for the next meal. And he puts in his request and he says, I'd like Chef Guido to make me his Italian specialty. So that way, nothing wrong with Chef Jacques' uh, preparation. But I actually, you can tell that the king preferred Chef Guido's meal, the fact that he requested it uh, for, 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 for the next menu. Kach, so the Medrash says, now that we have that parable, Kach, he kriv noach korban, the haya arev lahakadosh baruchu. So let's go back to the story of Noah. Noah gets off the ark, and what does he do? He offers a sacrifice to God. Shenamar. Vayorach Hashem et Reach Anichach. And God was happy with that, as it says that God imbibed the savory fragrance of Noah's sacrifice. Ikrivu Yisrael, the Haya Arev Lahakadosh Baruchu. But the Jewish people also offered sacrifices, and that too was pleasing to God. The Ein Anu Yodim, Imehem Arev Lo Biyoter, and we don't know. Which sacrifice did God prefer? Noah's sacrifice or Israel's sacrifice? The fact that God commands Israel 
to bring a sacrifice or to bring a series of sacrifices, Anu Yodim, Shishel Yisrael, who Arev Biyoter. We can infer that God prefers the Jewish people's sacrifice above the Noahide's sacrifice. In other words, Noah represents all the nations of man, and that's one kind of sacrifice. And the Jewish people offer a sort, a sort of unique kind of Jewish sacrifice. And the fact that God tells only the Jewish people, I want you to bring me this korban or these korbanos, that in itself is a sign that God prefers the, the korbanos of the Jewish people over the korbanos of Noah and his descendants. And that's why the verse in the book of Malachi says, that it will be pleasing to God, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, just like days of old and just like earlier years. That when God says these sacrifices are pleasing to me, he's hearkening back to the days when Moshe and the Jewish people brought sacrifices and then the times of King Solomon during the first temple. Okay, so the question now becomes, what are we supposed to make of this Midrash? Whose karbanos does God prefer? We have to first ask ourselves the question, what is the difference in the analogy that we gave Jacques prepared a French cuisine. Um, Guido prepared an Italian cuisine. So we can tell the king prefers Italian cuisine over French cuisine, or he in, prefers Guido's type of cooking over Jacques' type of cooking. But what is the inherent difference between a Noahide sacrifice and an Israelite sacrifice? That's really the question that we're asking. What is the Midrash really trying to convey to us? So Rav, that's the, really the approach that Rav Cook takes in trying to break down this Midrash. And so in his Sefer Midbar Shur, which is a collection of his Drashot, he explains as follows. He says, Let us try and explore what the difference between these two Karbanot are the Noahide korban versus the Israelite korban. Kefi asher tasi yad sichlenu, to the extent that our intellects can, can penetrate. Vihine ha-pu'ula she pa'al noach bekorbano hu kiyum yishuvo shel olam. Let's think about what Noach accomplished by bringing a korban when he came off the ark. What was he doing? He was appeasing God and demonstrating to God how man is worth keeping around, essentially. Let man live in this world. He can do great things. He can offer sacrifices. He can be productive. He can be live a moral and ethical existence. So if we look at Parshat Noach, what does it say? That God imbibed the savory fragrance of Noah's sacrifice. Vayomer Hashem el Lo osif lekalel odet ha'adama ba'avur ha'adam v'gomer. God said, after imbibing the fragrance of Noah's sacrifice, he says, I will never again curse the earth because of man. Velo osif od lahakotet kol chai ka'asher asiti, nor will I ever afflict uh, all living creatures as I did with the flood. So sort of the sacrifice is sort of showing man's redemptive qualities, right? So what God was basically promising in exchange for this sacrifice is that he would sustain all of existence, all of life, and especially all of mankind using nature. And that's certainly the primary objective of all of existence is to preserve the human intellect, which is capable of enjoying and observing all of nature and all of creation. So that's really what the Noahide sacrifice accomplishes, abiding uh, uh, by man and sustaining mankind and allowing man's 
cog cognitive faculties to appreciate this world and to appreciate God. Omnam korbinotehem shel Yisrael bimei Moshe u'shlomo pa'alu hashra'at hashchina Yisrael. But there is the difference, and it almost relates to what we were learning before in the Kuzarib between the two types of kavod, right? There's the kavod that we perceive in nature, and there's the prophetic kavod that only a prophet can, can apprehend. He says there's the type of divinity that God can rest in this world, especially within the Jewish people, um, and that's what our karbanot represent. He says, there's a higher level of human comprehension that far transcends human intellect. And that is the spirit of prophecy that man has this prophetic ability to perceive God in a way that far transcends man's perception of God in nature. It's almost parallel to what we were learning in the Kuzari, would you not say? Just, just by coincidence, I did not plan it that way. Behine, so, so, so God's divinity that rests within the Jewish people, the cloud of glory that rests within us when we offer the Korbanot, so it's a completely different kind of exchange. The Noahide offers his Korban, and God thereby allows man to perceive creation in all of its majesty. The Jew, uh, Moshe, Shlomo in this first temple brings the Korban and allows man to perceive God on a prophetic level, far transcending the majesty of creation. And now let's observe something quite interesting. When we look at the Torah, the Torah calls God's karbanot bread and a savory fragrance. So the korban is actually called God's bread, and it's also called something that God finds to be very uh, satisfying um, on a fragrance level. Okay, nikra gam lechem gam reach. So it's called both bread and fragrance. Now go back to the story of Noah. It doesn't say that God enjoyed the bread of Noah's sacrifice, but rather, and by the way, lacham in Arabic is meat. Just by, isn't that an interesting idea? Um, in other words, there's, and Hebrew and Arabic are very much related. Bread doesn't just mean um, something made out of the five grains in, in the generic sense. Lechem means that which sustains, that which I ingest and which nourishes me, okay? And the difference between a fragrance and lechem is that a fragrance is something that I inhale. It's very satisfying, but it doesn't nourish. Bread is a nourishing um, ingredient that I place in my body and through the transformative powers of my body, that bread becomes part of me and nourishes me. And we're going to see this idea. He says, with Noah's sacrifice, it's not called bread. It's just called a fragrance. So what's the difference between bread and fragrance? Okay, let's think about it for a second. You see a goat chewing on some grass, okay? The grass goes inside the body of the goat and through a process of digestion, which is in itself a miracle, the grass becomes part of the body of the goat. In other words, caloric intake, whatever you take in is added to your body, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, if it's chocolate, it goes straight to your hips. That's what my wife always tells me, right? I don't know of such things because I'm not built the same way. But that's what, that's what a lot of women lament, is that whatever you take in becomes part of your body, okay? 
So in other words, when you think about it philosophically, the grass has not fulfilled its objective or its purpose for being until it goes into the body of the goat and converts from vegetation to being a part of the goat. And scientifically, this is what this is the way uh, scientists have analyzed it, I guess, in, the, in, in his time, that there's a process of transformation. I don't even know what it would be called. I'm sure there's a scientific name for this, where nutrition, nutritive foods convert into the part to being part of the body. It goes into the bloodstream, it oxygenates the blood and, and all of the things that take place when a person acquires new nutrition. Oh, sorry, I, uh, I read the same line. In other words, uh, lower organisms like grass can convert themselves even genetically into higher level organisms, but it's through a process of digestion where the grass goes into the body of the goat and undergoes that transformation. He says, in the same process would ha presumably happen as well when a human being ingests something organic or meat or whatever it is that he's ingesting, that lower level organism goes through a process of, of conversion transformation to become part of the human being. Al panim. So however you're going to look at it, in Yan Hamazon Poel, so he says, basically, food, lechem, is something that is transformed through that ingestion process. It is elevated from a lower level of organism to a higher level. But that's not true with fragrance. Says even though the fragrance may enter into the nostrils of the inhaler, uh, but nothing inherently changes about the fragrance or the smoke that is being inhaled. It doesn't undergo a transformation. All it does is that it enhances the mind or the feelings of the inhaler but it doesn't undergo this transformation that we discussed before with food. And that's really the difference between lechem and fragrance. It represents this divide of, of whether or not a person can become um, enhanced uh, through the ingestion of the item. So in other words, um, does a person become enhanced just intellectually or does it become fundamentally transformed? So this is the difference between lechem and fragrance. Fragrance enhances me when I smell something very fragrant, um, it may put me in a good mood. When I smell uh, uh, my wife's perfume, it may fill me with pleasure. Uh, when I smell something aromatic coming from the kitchen, my appetite is triggered and I, but these are all mental uh, triggers that are a result of fragrance. But, I'm, but am, have I been fundamentally nourished or transformed as a result of taking anything in that has undergone a change? No. That's the difference between an intellectual um, uh, stimulus and something and prophetic stimulus where I'm, I'm inherently transformed because that's really what happens when I, have an, when I have a prophetic revelation. It's something that has entered into me and completely transformed my being, not just allowed me to be intellectually enhanced. That's the difference that Rav Cook is making between the fragrance of Noah's sacrifice, which really just informs God that man is capable of being an intellectually moral and ethical being and appreciating creation versus the Jewish korban, which is not only fragrant, but it is also lechem, 
it nourishes us and elevates us to a completely different level of organism through the fact that we can become, have prophetic revelation. That's the way he's portraying it, okay? And so he says, Ki ha-hashlama ha-enoshit im ki ta'aleta adam mashpil matzavo el madrega rama. He says, because even though um, a person will be intellectually enhanced and stimulated by having some kind of intellectual stimulus, but he, but he doesn't fundamentally change. He's just become a more, let's say, augmented human being. But when a person becomes a prophet and undergoes some kind of prophetic revelation, that's a, that represents a fundamental transformation of the individual into becoming divine. And he brings scripture to, 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 to bear this, to bring this to bear. And therefore for Noah's korban, which represents man's ability to reach the apex of his humanity, that's God imbibing the fragrance of Noah's sacrifice. Doesn't, doesn't fundamentally change what the human being is, just shows what greatness the human being is capable of. But with the, with the uh, Jewish sacrifice, God calls it both my bread and my fragrance. It is called bread because it represents the idea that the Jew has the ability to be fundamentally transformed through the bringing of the sacrifice because the divine presence comes down and imbues the human being with a spirit of God that, ought, that completely transforms the human being into another class of creation. And it's also called something fragrant because his humanity is elevated in the process as well. Because in addition to being fundamentally changed as a result of the divine presence resting in my midst, I am also augmented on purely the human level to acquire a greater sense of wisdom and understanding. And so we'll finish it up. I'm skipping a whole bunch of it. He says, Im kein, in yana korban shal noach, lo haya efshar shiyomar lo binuvua shiyakriv. That is why God never commanded noach in a prophecy to bring a korban. Ki ikar ho ra'ato hayal shlimut ha'seichel ha'enoshi. And because noach's sacrifice was really to just reflect upon man's perfected human intellect, which is less, which is lower than the level of the prophet. And therefore, he only brought it based on an intellectual compulsion. But that's what the Midrash is reflecting on. And it's why God specifically commanded the Jews through a prophetic communication in the Torah, I want you to bring korbanot. The fact that it is communicated prophetically, we see that it is of a higher quality and it is what God prefers. God wants man to be fundamentally transformed through a divinity that permeates him, which is what the Korban of the, Jew, the Jewish people represents. And that's why the verse says in Malachi, that it is pleasing to God. What is pleasing? Is that man is essentially transformed. Even though God is satisfied when man reaches his, in, his intellectual apex, but it's still not as pleasing to him, right, as the, as the meal that is prepared by him who is fundamentally transformed through that offering. Alkain Ba'a Alehanavua, Kemoshitahlita Shlamata Ishlamata Dvekut Alokit, 
Anishpat al Yidei Shlimut HaNevuah Miyuchered L'Yisrael. Right, he's just really repeating himself and basically says that the prophetic augmentation or enhancement of the Jewish people is comes through prophecy because they really go hand in hand. That's why Moshe said that we will be distinguished. Uh, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. And this is why Moshe said that our ability to connect with you, God, is that we have divinity rest within us, whereas the other nations do not. Okay, Linda, go ahead. It was, it was given in the Torah. The Torah is the ultimate, ultimate prophetic communication. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, next question. Red, plug for my upcoming article in Chach Melev. Uh, that's what Karen wants to know. What's, uh, remind us, Karen, what the article is about? God's bread. God's bread. Okay, so look for uh, Karen's article. Uh, so uh, Deb asks, but then why couldn't we sacrifice bread instead of animals? Ah, so there are two types of sacrifices. There's animal sacrifices and there's flower sacrifices. And there's a time to offer an animal sacrifice, which man has a greater association with. And there's a time to offer flower offerings, which man has less of an association with because they're a, a, they're a lower level of organism that the human being doesn't relate to as readily. So uh, Deb is saying, God is compassionate and using animals to slaughter for our well-being. We're not eating it, but just offering. Yes, the, the, um, the, the purpose of the korban is to allow God to uh, inhabit us, to inhabit mankind, and to rest his divine presence upon mankind. So it's not to nourish the human being in the conventional sense, but it is nonetheless a form of transformation that happens when I eat something. Just like when I eat something, I'm transformed by the thing that I have eaten. So too, when I bring a korban to God, I am because it is a type of bread for God, it is a bread for me as well on a spiritual plane in that it transforms me inherently, just like regular bread transforms me. Okay, yes. No, we will be, we will bring carbonos. The question is what kind of carbonos? Will they be animals and Veg vegetable sacrifices, or will they be just vegetable sacrifices like Rav Cook suggests? Yes. Why? Because, you know, as you're asking, we'll be on such a high level of awareness right. that uh, service, divine service, will not be necessary anymore. There is this concept of antinomianism that when we are in, uh, in an elevated state, we won't have to do certain mitzvot anymore. We'll be exempt from certain mitzvot, which were there purely to remind us of, of God's presence in our lives. But apparently the karbanot do not fall into that category. Um, and um, there will still be an expectation that we, even no matter how enhanced our understanding of Hashem is, the korban is of inherent value in that it allows a Jew to periodically connect with Hashem on a level that he wouldn't normally necessarily do on a daily basis. That's, that's all we know about it. Uh, just by the way, I want to point out that Rav Cook in uh, elsewhere, where he talks about that in the future world, there'll only be vegetable sacrifices. He uses the very Pasuk that he quoted from the Midrash over here. The Areval Hashem Minchat Yehuda V'Yerushalayim Kimei Olam Uchshanim Kadmoniyot. Notice, the, what does the word Mincha mean? Mincha is the word used in Hebrew for a veg, vegetable offering, a flower and oil offering. Why does the prophet Malachi only refer to the Mincha why doesn't he say Va'orval Hashem Korban Yehuda V'Yerushalayim, which is the generic term including both animal and um, 
uh, and the vegetable sacrifices. So he says the way you read the second part of the Pasuk is that mincha will be kimei olam, as good as the way we used to do it, uchashanim kadmoniot, that the way we did it in the old days when we offered animals. The new way, the new order will be to only offer the mincha and not to offer the zevach and the chatat and the asham and all of the other animal sacrifices. Okay. Um, is the animal chosen for sacrifice? Is his soul elevated? Yes, the animal, in other words, when a person brings an animal sacrifice, the animal is elevated through that process more so than when a human being ingests the animal for food. Yeah, so it sounds like so, we have someone in our in our chevra today who's um, very compassionate to animals, which is uh, uh, which is quite proper, and that's part part of the reason that. Um, that Rav Cook is uh, convinced that in the future world, as man evolves to a to a state of where he won't be able to bring himself to kill animals for his own benefit, that's the reason why vegetables will be used instead of animals for sacrifices. Okay, we'll hold it here for today, everybody, and um, have a great week. Uh, let me also wish you a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. This is our last class before Yantif, and we'll see you, Mir Tzashem. Uh, I guess Elaine will let us know when our next uh, meeting is, but probably the Tuesday after Pesach, okay? Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi? Thank you. Thank you.